junctures from Liverpool, England. People all over the world are just beginning to talk about the Beatles. My model of business is the Beatles. You know, they were four very talented guys. One, two, three. To lead a better life. Hello, my name's Paul McCartney. This is Ringo Starr. This is John Lennon. I'm George Harrison. Welcome to a very special episode of the Here, There, and Everywhere podcast. I'm your host, Jack Lawless. Today marks a significant milestone for us as we celebrate our 50th episode. So thank you to all listeners and guests for joining us on this incredible journey. And we have some really fantastic episodes coming up, and I hope you're as excited to listen as we are to make them. Today we have a great episode for you. I'm thrilled to welcome two distinguished guests whose latest work has captured the essence of a crucial period in the life of one of the greatest musicians of all time. Joining us today are Alan Cozen and Adrian Sinclair, the brilliant authors of The McCartney Legacy Volume 1, 1969-1973, an extraordinary biography that unravels the untold stories behind the legendary Paul McCartney. Their collaboration on the McCartney legacy sheds new light on an area when Paul McCartney embarked on his solo career after the breakup of the Beatles. Through meticulous research and captivating storytelling, Alan and Adrian delve into the musical evolution, personal struggles, and creative genius that defined this period of Paul's career. In today's interview, we'll explore the fascinating discoveries, anecdotes, and insights that Alan and Adrian have uncovered about Paul McCartney during these pivotal years. We'll discuss the creative process behind their book and important moments in Paul's life. So get ready to dive into the McCartney legacy with the brilliant minds behind it. Alan Cozen and Adrian Sinclair. Hey, Alan and Adrian, thank you guys so much for coming on the podcast. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Good. Thanks. A few months ago, you both released one of the largest and most detail-oriented Paul McCartney biographies, The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973. Alan and Adrian, how did you both first hear the music of the Beatles? Well, Alan, you, you were probably a little before me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I first heard them in, I was out shopping with my father in Sears in December 1963 and they and I want to hold your hand came on the radio and that was you know pretty early in in the story in the US anyway and then I watched them when they played on Ed Sullivan and uh, you know I was like 8 or 9 years old and it was it was really sort of a big thing in school I mean everybody had Beatles gum cards and little Beetle wigs they were selling at the time. And we used to sort of go down in people's basements and play the records and get a broom and, you know, pretend that we were the Beatles. And it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. So really that far back, never been the same. <laughs> yeah, I was a little bit later because I because I was born three days after John Lennon died. So I was born on the 11th of December, 1980. And really, I'm what you would call maybe a third generation Beatles fan. So I grew up listening to the Beatles on the radio. My mum and dad had records and tapes. But really, when I kind of took a deep dive into the Beatles was when the anthology sets started coming out. And I remember buying uh, the first two of those sets on cassette and then the third one on, on compact disc, because I think by that time I had a CD player. And yeah, uh, you know, for me, you know, growing up in the Britpop era, I used to hear, you know, groups like Oasis and Blur and, you know, all of the bands that were around that time used to quote the Beatles as their biggest influence. So for me, you know, going back to the source was far more interesting than hearing the music secondhand, you know, because a lot of those guys in, in, in the Britpop days would be playing covers of the Beatles as well. You know, Oasis famously covered I Am The Walrus. You know, I think they put that out as a B-side on one of their singles. So, yeah, for for me, you know, the second I heard some of those tracks on the anthology, those melodies and harmonies and lyrics and experimentation, I was hooked. And that was it. I just wanted to consume every available piece of audio and video that had been made by them. (laughs) 
and then and then that got me into the realms of you know listening to their albums and bootlegs and everything like that and you know the rest is history and you both come from very accomplished backgrounds and careers can you walk us through how you decided to collaborate on this project called the mccartney legacy well i mean the the collaboration and the book itself I, I explain in the acknowledgements at the back of volume one that the book happened by accident and really that's no exaggeration you know i set out to write a book this was me personally that had a, a very different kind of uh, plan originally it was just going to be exploring paul in the studio and you know more of a reference book i guess um, but, but then as the book evolved I, you know, Alan came on board very early to work with me, you know, when we were going to do it as a, a kind of sessionography type book. And then the, the book evolved into a fully, fred, fully fledged biography in micro detail because we realized that, you know, separating the man from his music was impossible. And really the story was far more interesting if he told the whole story rather than just a fragment of it. You know, there are a lot of books out there that explore different facets of Paul's life. You know, the, there are books that will analyze his music and the chord structures. And there, there are books that analyze Paul on the road. There are books that analyze his life. And we decided that we didn't want to separate all of those elements. We wanted to tell the, the whole story as one. And it makes for a really fascinating read when you tell it as an unfolding narrative. You know, for people who don't necessarily know Paul's life uh, in the detail that we do, um, I think if you pick up the book and you, if you just read it, you know, as, as I don't know, a slightly detached reader, it, it's, it, it reads like a really brilliant, ripping story. And yeah, like I said, you know, Al, Alan came on board, you know, fairly early on, and that's kind of how the collaboration kicked off. This book focuses on Paul's life from 1969 until 1973. Why did you choose this era specifically to focus on? Well, the plan is, is I was going to say was, but it, it, it is to do his whole life and his whole career. And But we knew that we wanted to get into the kind of detail that wasn't going to fit in a single volume. So we broke it up so that the the first one would go through band on the run i think early on we might have had it ending a little earlier than that even but we kind of realized that band on the run first of all even if you're only a casual fan of paul mccartney band on the run is an album that you're going to know and you're going to want to read about so we wanted to make sure it was in there but also narratively it creates a great arc because the book starts when the Beatles have broken up. Paul is depressed. He doesn't know what he's going to do. And, and he begins to sort of try and cobble a solo career together out of the wreckage of the Beatles. And, you know, he's, he's putting out each of his albums and getting wings together, touring with wings, recording with wings. And uh, People like it, fans like it, people buy it, it charts well, but the critical reaction is uh, very mixed all through. But then you get to Band on the Run, which is the end of the book, and he's got a complete triumph. The critics love it. The public loves it. It, it goes up to number one three times in the U.S. And so it, it just seemed like, you know, if you're going to tell a, a story in chunks, this is a great chunk to have because it starts in disarray and ends in triumph and that's always a good way to to end a book yeah we originally planned to end the first volume when denny sywell and henry mcculloch quit wings but then we realized ourselves like alan said it, i think it would uh, it would have been maybe a less satisfactory ending to the book if we'd have ended it on a, a down note so we decided to complete the narrative arc of you know, Paul emerging from the ashes of the Beatles and kind of ending the book on his kind of rock and roll throne uh, for a second time. So like, like Alan said, it's kind of more of a fulfilling narrative arc to end it the way that we did. And, you know, the, like the premise was always to cut Paul's solo career down into bite-sized chunks. And this just happens to be the first one. The second book, which we're working on at the moment, will take the story through to sometime in 1980. 
that we we won't give away now because we don't want to spoil where we get to when people pick up the second volume in a couple of years from now. I think that's a really fascinating period of Paul's life to focus on, and you're completely right. Somehow it fits that hero narrative arc where it starts off in disarray and ends up in a triumph, just like you said. And another thing that really stands out about this book is the amount of detail that's included. As I was reading this, it really felt like I was reading a work of fiction because of how involved I was in the storyline and the detail and every single thing that was going on. I thought that was really cool. Now, what was the research process like for writing this book? And how did you approach gathering information and conducting interviews? Well, I suppose when you're delving back in time as far as we did, which is kind of 50 plus years, you always end up lost in the fog slightly. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of people still around. Uh, and there's a lot of information still around, uh, but there's a lot of contradiction. So I suppose what we had to do was, you know, and this was part of the research process, was to find as many people who were still around as possible and speak to them, and then find out as much information as we possibly could. And then we threw the whole thing into a sieve and we shook it until the story came out of the other side. Really for us, the you know one of the big discoveries we made was when we were speaking to Denny Sywell, the former Wings drummer, and he volunteered his and his wife's kind of pocket diaries that they kept for this period. So we ended up with, from the two of them, you know, three plus years of, of Paul's life and, and, and the Wings story and, and going back into Ram as well that was, you know, kind of undisputed. And I don't think anybody's really been ever, you know, been in that position before when they've been writing a book about Paul. We kind of had, you know, the inside story of Wings for that entire period, you know, handed to us. So we, we like you say, we ended it with a, you know, a fairly undisputed timeline. And, you know, when we were, when we were researching the book, we decided that we wanted to do all of the research from the ground up. Because the other thing we found was that there were a lot of inaccuracies out there on the internet, in books, you know, everywhere we went, we were finding inaccuracies. So we decided to just kind of do away with all of the materials that were around us and only take information that we got from first-hand sources. You know, so when people pick up the book, what they're, what they're looking at is, you know, a fairly undisputed timeline for that period there's there's no guesswork in times of the de- you know in terms of the dates that we have in the book and the details you know they all come from uh, very reliable sources but yeah the the research period for that book was you know something close to 8 years really from beginning to end so it was a lot of work you know between Alan and myself piecing the story back together also i i had a a, a reasonably good Beatles research library, having sort of clipped articles from the 1960s forward all through these years and, you know, solo article articles about them as solo artists and as the Beatles. And, but Adrian had access to the British library, which has every publication in the known universe. And so if Paul went on a trip, if we knew, you know, say from Denny Sywell's diary or other sources that Paul took his family on a trip up through Scotland on a particular week or weekend, Adrian looked at every single place that he would have stopped along the way. And usually there's an article. If Paul McCartney turned up in your town, you had an article saying what he did in town, what he what he wore, you know, everything. And these are articles that haven't been looked at for 50 years, you know. I mean, they're in, in small newspapers reported by the local staff. You know, they'll talk to people in the hotel where he stayed, you know, and not not – Every bit of information in there was useful to us, but it was very it was useful in general. And we were able to really get a lot of detail out of that kind of coverage, you know, not to mention all the 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 large newspaper and magazine coverage from over the years, too. So we ended up amassing an archive of really thousands of interviews, thousands of audio and video interviews as well. We have a, a ton of stuff to work with. So, you know, just assembling the library was a huge task, you know, before even starting to write. 
and we're and we're still we're still always assembling so there's there's always more yeah it's because it's like you said you you kind of end up with a lot of information but then it's what you do with information uh, to transform it into narrative i think that's really where the difficulty is with a project like ours because it could it could be a really dull read you could just be reading dates and details and it could be really monotonous, but we wanted it to be a lively read, you know, like you were reading a novel about Paul's life, but a novel that's completely based in fact. Um, so, you know, we, we trawled everywhere we could possibly find, you know, there's archives all over the world with information. You just got to go out there and look for it. And we assimilated all of that. And, you know, that became almost the skeleton of the book, I suppose. And then we fleshed that out with all of these other stories that we found from people we interviewed, details we got from newspaper reports, audio interviews, video interviews, you name it. You know, so I think when we when we boiled down how many pieces of information or how many articles went into that first book, it was something in the region of 33,000, I think. So there was, there was a lot of sources that went into that. It's, it's funny to think when you're holding the book that you're holding that much information in your hands that you really are. That, you know, there was a there was, there was so much detail and so much information went into just that those you know 700 plus pages. And there were some unusual things too, like you know, if we, I think uh, if Adrian's reading an article about say the 1972 European tour and someone mentions that the guy managing the tour is someone named John Morris and we look into John Morris and we find out that he had been the manager of the Fillmore East and he worked with Bill Graham on the at the Fillmore West in Winterland and he'd done all kinds of other stuff he ran the Rainbow Theater in London and you know Adrian would say well Let's find John Morris. Now, no one had talked to John Morris. You know, John Morris is, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many interviews he's done in his life, but, it, you know, you don't run into, into interviews with him anywhere. But he had an incredible career and he ran this particular tour and he had tons of stories about it. He was very willing to talk once we found him. And, you know, and so I, we interviews like that sort of gave us something unusual in areas that people just haven't looked before. And, and it was really helpful. And while you were going through all of those articles and interviews and research, did you encounter any contradiction in narrative? And if you did, how did you deal with that? Oh, yeah, so, so many. And uh, yeah, yeah, de dealing with contradiction, I think, is probably one of the hardest things that we we face as you know historians slash authors, because you you might speak to four people, and two of them will tell you the same story, two of them will tell you a different story, you know, and kind of who's telling the truth. So then you have to examine all the other sources of information you have around that story, to to find which side of the story is more likely, and we were encountering that all the time. I suppose the biggest example of that was when I found a piece of, well, a, a few documents in an archive in America relating to the song Live and Let Die. And I started reading through this memo that had been sent by two people and it instantly made me question the story, story that we've heard so many times over the years, which is that you know, George Martin goes to uh, Jamaica to meet with the producers of the Bond film and he sits down for lunch and they basically say to him, you know, that's a great recording, George, but who are we going to get to sing the song in the film? And we've always come to accept that story as being the, the producers of, you know, Live and Let Die wanted to drop Paul McCartney's vocal from the uh, film soundtrack but when we looked at the documentation it didn't tally so when we you know when we started examining the facts what we came to realize that was actually what was more likely the case was that george martin and the film producer harry saltzman they kind of they, they weren't quite seeing eye to eye while they were having lunch together you know it was it was a misunderstanding rather than the producers wanting to oust you know one of the biggest pop stars on the planet from the roster of their film, which wouldn't have made any sense. So yeah, when we when we examined that story, we came to a very different conclusion. And you know, you can read the whole story in the book from the day that Paul wrote Live and Let Die through to the day that they delivered it. And you can read for yourself 
what's probably closer to the truth. But yeah, we found, we found stories like that all the time. And we, you know, this isn't something we were necessarily looking for either. We didn't go out there to nitpick history. We just went out there to write a book and tell the story. This is just kind of stuff that we found along the way that's ended up in the book. In the beginning of the book, you mentioned that Paul McCartney always says that he has two lives. There's the public Paul McCartney, and then there's the private Paul McCartney. What was it like for you to balance the story of those two lives? And were there any challenges in figuring out the detail in those lives? I don't think it was that difficult. The two Paul McCartneys, the thing is that, you know, what we are mainly going to see is the public Paul McCartney. The private Paul McCartney would come through interviews with people who work with him on a day-to-day basis. And, you know, sometimes memoirs people have written that involved incidents that, you know, included him, that kind of thing. And, it's not as if necessarily the public and private Paul are contradictory in a way. They can be, but we just why I don't why I'm saying it wasn't difficult is that basically, like Adrian said, you know, we went where the facts took us. And if we found something that was from the realm of the private Paul McCartney that seemed worth reporting, which, you know, could be anything. It could be car trips with his kids and Linda and, you know, they're not on stage. This is really sort of them privately. Um, but it feeds into the narrative of his work as well. You know, the, while you're writing about him going on a, a boat in Scotland on the way to the Orkneys and, you know, getting sick and on the way up there singing songs in the car with his kid, which ended up as, you know, bits of Uncle Albert. In fact, that whole trip bits ended up in Uncle Albert and Avril Halsey. You know, you're writing about the private Paul McCartney, but you sort of realize that when you get back to home in Scotland, where he was spending most of his time in those days, and you're sitting down to write songs, and then you're going to record Ram, all of these things are connected because the the bits that he's singing in the in the car and the the captain of the boat taking him to the Orkneys, all of these contribute elements to what became that song. You know, there's like so many different influences coming together in that case, but it's part of the private world at the time it's happening, and we just have to sort of chronicle it as the private world until it gets to the professional world and comes out as a song. And and really, I was just going to say, and really, I suppose his music, his songs are snapshots of his private life in a way. Because if you look at a song like Made the Unamazed, you know, that's a snapshot of Paul being depressed when the Beatles were imploding at the end of 69 into 70. And then you've got more obvious things, you know, like on Red Rose Speedway, you've got Power Cut, which is a story of power cuts when they were on tour in at the start of 1972. So, you know, all the way through the book, you do get those kind of snapshots of, of Paul's private life, not only through stories you hear from his private life, but also through his songs as well. And speaking of Paul's private life, the book begins with Paul in a very depressed period of his life when the Beatles have just broken up and he's trying to decide what to do next. And his solo career has a rough start with the critics, but eventually he has this mega, mega successful solo career. What do you both think that the most pivotal moment of his solo career was? And why do you think he never gave up? I think he's not a giving up kind of person, you know. He is, and basically everyone who's worked with him says this, going back to the Beatles themselves in their court depositions from when he had to sue to split Apple, and they characterize him, and Ringo says, you know, he'll go on and on until he gets his way. And that was, say, a a, a micro view of, you know, Paul working within the Beatles. But I think generally speaking in his life, he'll go on and on until he gets his way. It's just the way he is. You know, he has a vision of what he wants to do and he'll just he'll just do what it takes to make it happen. And if that means 
going to New York and hiring some session musicians to do what became Ram or going back to England and getting a band together or going, you know, on an unannounced bus tour of British universities just to get the band played in a bit or whatever it is that, that it, it, it takes, he'll do it and he'll do it in the best possible way that he can. You know, there's, there's something to be said for having made all the money he made during the Beatles, even though during our, our part of the book, that the part we cover in the book, he doesn't have access to a lot of that money, but he's still better off than most of us and better off than the other guys in wings. And so if they're going on a tour, he can pay for the sound system. He can pay for, he, he wants a bus, he'll get a bus, you know, whatever it is. So, so he's put his resources to the task of creating the reality that he wants. And I think it's his determination that has, that has, been responsible for his success. I mean, besides determination, you then have the the issue of, you know, what he's writing. Is he is he writing really great stuff? Is he writing not as great stuff or whatever? And and through the course of his entire career, that part goes up and down a bit, but, you know, his his determination to do each of the things he wants to do is, you know, what makes it happen. And if He's writing at his best, then, you know, it's banned on the run and it's successful. Um, if he's not quite at his best yet, it might be parts of wildlife that, you know, aren't as good or, but, you know, he, but he believes in what he's doing. That's the thing. That's, that's really the main thing that has, I think, made him successful. The fact that he believes in himself and is willing to do what it takes to make it happen. In terms of, you know, pivotal events in Paul's life, I think that there are two very uh, defining moments in 1969. He married Linda in March, and then his daughter Mary was born in September. And I would, it'd be very interesting to, 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 to think where this story would have ended up if he was still with Jane. And he was still playing games with other women as he was doing in 1968. But being that in 1969, when the Beatles imploded, he had a very strong woman by his side, a very leveling woman as well, Linda, you know, very, you know, she, uh, she really managed to calm him down and drag him out of the depression that he went into when the Beatles did implode. And the fact that he was a father as well. And at the end of 1969, that has such a profound impact on you being a father. And, and I think, you know, when it comes to, you know, what, how did Paul drag himself out of that funk and, you know, and, and make a, a second life for himself after the Beatles, I think that those two women had a really profound impact on all of that. You know, I think that the responsibilities of fatherhood and and being a husband made him realize that he couldn't, you know, sink into a deep depression and that he had to drag himself out of it. And Wings was what came out of that. Yeah. And that reminds me of a scene that happens at the beginning of this book where Paul is with one of his girlfriends and he's practically begging for her to treat him like a real person. And I think when Linda came along, she she did that 100%. Do you think he was looking to be held accountable for his actions and wanted someone to treat him like that? I don't think he was necessarily looking for Linda. I think that Linda kind of found him, you know, and their courtship played out over, a, you know, over a period of, I don't know, about a year, wasn't it? I mean, it was, a, but it was at least, at least several months anyway, between kind of London and New York and then back in London. So, you know, I, I think the right woman came along at the right time and, you know, and, and everything kind of fell in, into place for him. Even when it came to establishing wings, you know, Linda was bold enough to say, OK, I'll go out on stage with you and I'll sing harmony, even though she knew herself that she didn't have the greatest voice, that she was occasionally out of tune. You know, she stuck her neck on the block for the man that she loved. And, you know, really, they kind of were defiantly holding hands together all the way through this period and emerged from it together with Band on the Run. You know, Denny Lane has even said that he sees Band on the Run as Paul and Linda's album, you know, and that he was just some session guy who played on it. 
And I suppose that could be said of quite a lot of the music that was recorded during this period, really. It was, you know, it was even credited to Paul and Linda quite a lot of it and, and not credited to any of the other musicians who worked with them in Wings. And those guys, you know, for, for most of the recordings, with the exception, I think, of Denny Lane, maybe on the occasional song, who got a copyright credit, you know, they weren't making royalties or anything. So, yeah, it was really Paul and Linda against the world. And one thing you learn almost immediately from reading this book is that Paul's mind never stops thinking creatively. Right. What are some insights that you two have learned about Paul's creative process during the research that you've done? Basically, the fact that anything he does or anything he reads or anything he sees stands a chance of getting into a, becoming a song or becoming part of a song or even, even just a line or a reference in a song. And Adrian is, is especially good at sort of picking up on these things because I'll listen to a song like 1882 and, and think, yeah, it's a sort of a, you know, gruesome little tale, a little bit like, you know, Les Miserables and, you know, and Adrian will say, you know, around the time he's doing this, there are these, you know, sort of lynchings going on in Ireland with the IRA where they're sort of, you know, people who were caught collaborating with the British are being, you know, drawn and quartered and, you know, and it can't be an accident that this is go. this is in these newspapers at that time that Paul is reading and he's coming up with a story like this. And we've come up with tons of those things and especially Adrian, he's just really great at spotting these connections because also he's in the library sort of searching for all these you know particular article you know wings related or paul related articles as part of the research and also while he's doing that he's seeing what else is in the newspapers at the time but you know really an another one is we were we were talking about Admiral Halsey and, and all of its various influences a little earlier. Adrian noticed that, you know, well, you know, why is he, why is he bringing Admiral Halsey into this? We're talking about an American, you know, commander of the third fleet in world war two. It's a little bit obscure for Paul McCartney to be doing. And, and then Adrian notices that, uh, you know, when he was in New York, you know, before recording Ram, Wings went the, the year before, and at that time, the movie Tora, Tora, Tora was out, and James Whitmark played Admiral Halsey. And, you know, is it an accident? Sometimes it can be an accident, but Paul notices everything. And he may not have even noticed it consciously. It may have been subliminal, but somehow or other, we both concluded that it, it's not an accident that these things that Paul is in contact with are ending up in the songs. And you just have to sort of, it's, it's made us think a little differently, you know, pay attention a little more carefully to everything going on around Paul at the time we're writing about because it, you know, quite often will turn up soon enough in a song one way or another. It happens all the time. Like, like Alan said, you know, you'll be, I mean, we're researching at the moment for the second book, Wings at the Speed of Sound. And, you know, it's no coincidence that right in the middle of recording Wings at the Speed of Sound, there's no song on the album called Speed of Sound. So why, does, why is he thinking about the speed of sound? Well, it just so happened that on the 21st of January, when, when they were in the middle of recording that album, that Concorde took its first commercial flight between London and Bahrain. And in the newspaper, next to an article about the Beatles, is a piece about Concorde taking a flight at the speed of sound. So Paul's reading a piece about the Beatles, and then on the other page, he gets the title for his next album. But this happens all the time. You know, like Alan says, you know, he'll be writing a song that's based in 1882. But at the time, he's reading a newspaper about the IRA and he sees that someone's been uh, tarred and feathered. Um, so he takes that, he plucks that idea and he puts it in his song. He does it all the time, you know. And, and the thing is, you know, if you read Paul's own book, The Lyric, he talks about a lot of examples of this himself, you know, where he's, he's plucked the title from you know, the name of a shop or something he's got from a newspaper or a magazine or a film or whatever it might be. You know, John did the same thing, you know, for the benefit of being for the benefit of Mr. Kite was written about a poster. 
So this is something these guys are doing all the time. They're just brilliant assimilators of information, John and Paul, you know, to a genius level, really, to the, to the point where they could take a newspaper headline and turn it into a number one record. I mean, that's just incredible. And have your favorite Paul McCartney songs changed during the research process? Or have you discovered any new favorites as well? I have. I think before we wrote the book, it would have, I'm not sure what it would have taken for me to put wildlife on just to play it. But having gone through what went into wildlife and all the sessions and looking more carefully at the distinction between side one and side two of wildlife, side two has some beautiful stuff. I, I've, I've come to like that album a lot more than I did originally, but also certain songs that I had, you know, I'd known them and liked them, but never really thought that much about them. But like Backseat of My Car on Ram, I mean, I now think that is really one of his great masterpieces. It's just a stunningly beautiful song. It is full of complexities and detail. It lets him channel Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys in probably the best way he ever has. And he's done it a lot because he really admires Brian Wilson. But Backseat in My Car, it just has everything. And there's so much in it in terms of changes and structural things. It's, it really is like a little symphony. So that, Little Lamb Dragonfly from Red Rose Speedway, although it was recorded during the Ram sessions. That too, I, I'd never thought twice about it, but looking at it closely, dealing with how he wrote it, what he wrote it about, how he recorded it, it just, you know, it just strikes me now as like one of the great McCartney songs that many people don't know because it's sort of stuck on an album that a lot of people sort of pass by, Red Rose Speedway. Um, so yeah, a lot of things like that. I'm sure Adrian too has had some. Yeah, I was I was similar actually. I came into this project and Band on the Run was my favorite album from this period. And coming out of writing the the first book, I'd say that my two favorite songs from the whole period now are Some People Never Know from Wildlife, which is just exquisite. And a lot of people will probably complain that it's too long, but it's not too long. You should just enjoy every last second of that song. It's just magic. Uh, and uh, likewise, I think um, Little Lamb Dragonfly is just, I don't know, one of the most exquisite examples of Paul McCartney's uh, melodic gift and songwriting talent from that period. And when you understand the story behind it, and and the the beauty of the story behind it, which unfolds in in our book, you know, in kind of real time, it, it really makes you appreciate the final product a whole lot more than just listening to the song in isolation. You know, I think there are a lot of moments like that where Paul has taken a particularly poignant moment in his life and he's captured it in a song, and that's probably one of the best examples of it from that time, or from his entire career, in fact, I'd say. What would you say that this book contributes to everyone's collective understanding of Paul McCartney's life and his impact on music? Well, I'd, I'd like to think, given the size of the book and the period that it's covering, that we've put together probably the most insightful account of Paul's life in those years, 69 to 73. And really, we didn't leave anything out. Every, everything we found is in the book. We only made a couple of very small edits to the, the first couple of chapters that were related to the Beatles' finances. And you can read those in probably a dozen other books. Everything that we discovered, we, we, we found, found out. And I'd like to think, you know, there are a lot of people out there who've read the book who agree with that statement, you know, including the filmmakers who are currently putting together this feature documentary about Paul, Man on the Run, who we're now in dialogue with, you know. They read our book and they said it was incredible, almost like a roadmap for half of the film that they're putting together. So, you know, we're hoping to help them in some way. So I'd like to think that, you know, in terms of uh, documenting Paul's life beyond the Beatles, that we've made a really big contribution to that. 
I think one of the things we've tried to do and that we hope we've done is that we've presented Paul, first of all, as a real person. You know, he has, there are things that he does that readers will say, well, you know, that's a little arrogant or that's not the best thing he could have done. And there are things that are, you know, surprisingly, you know, compassionate as well. But we also wanted, you know, this this idea of the real person with actual dimension, just like all of us with good days and bad days and all of that is also just a supreme creator. And, you know, as we were saying before, his ability to transform the details of daily life or newspaper reading or whatever he's doing into these incredible songs, you know, we wanted to show that we wanted to show how we did it. We wanted to show why when we're talking about a song like Backseat of My Car, why it's such an incredible song without getting too much into the details of musical analysis, because we know, you know, a lot of people didn't take theory classes and all of that. So we're trying to describe it in a way that anybody could understand whether they're musicians or not. And that they'll get to see, you know, so this is what that spark of genius is. This is what made this track work in a way that it might not have worked if someone else did it, you know, you know, just the, the bits of insightful choices that he makes on, you know, what goes in, what the instrumentation is, you name it. But so we, you know, we just wanted to create a whole picture, you know, not just the great musician, not just the guy who's real famous, but sort of all of it together and, you know, make him someone that you could relate to you know, almost as if you knew him. Yeah, we get a lot of messages since the book came out saying things like, oh, you know, I've never listened to wildlife in my life. And since I've read your book you know it's now my favorite album and, and i really love that you know you know because we we spent such a long time piecing together those sessions and telling that story of of how wings came together and then after only a few days of rehearsals they were recording wildlife and you know linda giving birth to stella in the middle of the sessions that then giving the band a name wings and, you know, so for people to contact us and say, you know, that they're getting into different periods of Paul's music that they haven't explored before is really fulfilling because that's really what we set out to do. You know, we we set out to do this project because we really like Paul's music. And, you know, we hope that people, when they put down the book, have a deeper understanding and appreciation of it like we did when we were writing it. Well, I think that you guys have accomplished that and more in the process of writing this, because as far as I'm concerned, this is the only book that I need to read about Paul McCartney in my life. I mean, it has everything. It has his personal life, his music, the ups, the downs, everything. And and for people listening who want to get this book, where can they check this out? Well, you'll be able to find the book anywhere. It's on general release, so... If you go down to your local bookstore, whether you're in the States or Europe or on the other side of the world in Australia, you should be able to find the book in your local bookstore or online through Amazon. And if you want you know, uh, to find out more about Alan and I and what we're doing, we've got our own website, which is just the McCartneylegacy.com. And you know, our contact information is on there and details of how to buy the book as well. And there's even a few reviews in there of the book from when it came out at the start of this year. I'm glad you 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 find this the only Paul McCartney book that that you need. And we we've actually heard that a bunch, but don't forget that you'll also need volumes two, three, and four. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that actually leads me to my next question, which is what are you guys up to now? How much can you tell us about these next volumes? We're working on them. We're working on volume two right now. And I've got to say, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't want to tip my hand too much. If Adrian does, he can. But for all that people are saying that they're finding so much surprising stuff in the first volume, the first volume has nothing on the second volume. The second volume is, I mean, things are surprising me right and left. And so I, it really just gets better. But that's basically, that's at least what I'm doing almost full time right now. And, and I think Adrian is too. 
he's you know a bit ahead of me in the timeline and he's been writing he he just wrote one of the chapters you know we've we both have written uh parts of 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 the first volume and so that's that's what i'm doing adrian yeah the 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 second volume's coming together um like alan said it's it's funny i kind of joked with alan at the end of last year that you know uh, i think the second volume could be better than the first volume i, I don't know we'll, we'll see when we get to the end but there's there's a lot of surprising stuff in there i think I think the main thing is that that period, uh, the the kind of Wings Mark One period, with Denny Lane, Denny Sywell, and Henry McCulloch, it's a fairly well known story. And what we did was we fleshed it out and we told it, you know, in in a, a very kind of accurate chronology. But this period we're going into now, there are so many things that are underexplored. I mean. Who's ever written anything about the recording of the Mike McGear album at the start of 1974? Well, we've written a whole chapter on it, you know, mm-hmm. for the next book. And there's so there's so many things like that that are going into this second volume. And uh, yeah, there's yeah, it, it it's shaping up really well. And we really hope that it's going to be finished, hopefully by the end of this year for release next year. But yeah, we 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 don't want to confirm a release date for it because it'll inevitably end up changing, just like the release date for our first book did twice or three times, I think. So, but yeah, we're hoping for it to be out in 2024, but it might knock into 2025, you know, depending on what the situation is with our publisher. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on the podcast, and thank you even more for writing this incredible book. Thanks for having us, and glad you like it. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Thanks so much for having us on. Thank you all for listening to another episode of the Here, There, and Everywhere podcast. Thank you to Alan and Adrian for coming on the podcast and for writing this incredible book. If you want to check out this book, check out the links in the podcast description. And you can.